These Gentle Communists by Mary Thomas This essay won the first prize in a creative writing contest conducted by the Atlantic Monthly. It was published in the Catholic Digest, July 1944. I know that communism can work. I have seen it. I go to college on a communist farm as a member of a family of 1,200 women. This is possible for me because 1,400 years ago a boy ran away from school and hid from his master in a cave. He was not an ordinary truant. He ran away because he felt he must learn holiness. That boy was Benedict, founder of the Benedictine Order. He stayed in his cave and grew up a scholarly religious hermit. And because goodness is a natural magnet to man, there gathered about him other men. At Monte Cassino a community was formed for men to live, so that they might save their souls. They lived very simply working in the earth with their hands and praising God in their words and their lives. They were a family living together. Parents sent young boys to the monasteries to live, and they had to be educated. The Christian monks spread the warmth of their holiness over the Greek classics and opened wide the Bible and the writings of the early churchmen. I am a senior at the College of St. Benedict at St. Joseph, Minnesota. Conducted by a community of Benedictine nuns. Here, on a prairie farm, 1,200 women live the pattern of life set by the first monks who gathered livelihood from the valley surrounding Monte Cassino. Many of them, of course, live in branch houses where they teach parochial schools nurse take care of orphans and the aged They shared their goods as a family does. It is communism that works. No one receives a salary. All receive all they need. Products of the farm and the community workshops supply many needs. Life here is almost reminiscent of a self-subsistent medieval manor. I came to St. Benedict's thinking it only an ordinary small college, but gradually I became aware of the productive activity here. The south wind came into a lecture room, warm and scented. I went to stare, almost unbelieving, at row upon row of pink and white puffs of apple blossoms. Bees turned whole trees brown and alive as they gathered honey for our next winter's breakfasts. I began to learn about the farm. Out at the poultry yard, turkeys rushed to the fence and gobbled at me, twenty-five hundred of them. In the fall, these birds appear brown and resplendent on community tables, scientifically and lovingly tended from egg to platter. One day, I stopped at the refrigeration plant. The butcher proudly opened a refrigerator door to show me rows of beef quarters, hog halves, curing hams, and bacon. He cares for all the meat consumed by the community. While he explained his art, my glance fell on the spindle-hook on the wall, where the cook had left the day's instruction. 
attached to the meat order from the kitchen, I saw a bright note wishing him a happy feast day. And I saw that there was tangible evidence of the communal spirit I was beginning to know. Candles are made. Rugs woven. Books bound as well as written. A college conducted. And the community fed and clothed. And all these activities are carried on by real communists, each nun working according to her talents and receiving according to her needs. The strong work more, the weak less. And the plan is successful. I have seen it in operation for four years, and I know that in 1943 was celebrated the 1,400th anniversary of the founding of this manner of living. An agitator for Marxian communism would give a stack of pamphlets and perhaps an autographed copy of Das Kapital to be able to point to such a working model of his system. There are many reasons why the Benedictine kind of communism works. Personal initiative is possible and encouraged. Those who have creative ability may write. Scholars may study. Those who dream of a better campus may make it better, like Sister Juliana. At 64, she was retired from teaching to live outdoors for health. On one of her long daily walks, she decided the campus needed evergreens. She planted seedlings. Today, those seedlings are a block-long row of pine and spruce flanking the gardens. They are fir trees a rest for yellow warblers in the spring, and a cooling shade from the summer sun. They are cedar boughs, with blueberries hung like jewels in a winter bouquet. From evergreens, Sister Juliana turned to an orchard, a vineyard, a nursery. There are acres of strawberries and raspberries, because she was free to follow her initiative, and in my hair I have worn red geraniums from her greenhouse. Sister Juliana is 84 now, and can look at the campus with satisfaction, knowing that she has done much to make it beautiful. But when she reads this, she will wrinkle up her nose and say, Glory be to God, I didn't do a thing. Individual desires and ideas are given consideration. There is no ruthless heel to stamp out special characteristics. Each group establishes a convenient way of activity. The nuns who extract honey from the combs take a loaf of bread and a thermos bottle of breakfast coffee with them to work. At mid-afternoon, they take their bread and coffee with a pail of honey to a bench in the sun to lunch and talk. The nun who spins flax has a shelf of holy pictures and ivy, and a prayer printed in German in her room. The men who do the heavier farm work have their own orchestra and play for a college barn dance. These workmen become a very real part of the community. They live together in a dormitory known to college students as the frat house, and in quiet ways influence the life of the community. A real spirit of cooperation and reciprocal service is evident in all the workings of the community. 
A college teacher notices some morning that the hem of her habit is badly worn, but she does not take the day off from classes to mend it. Instead, she takes it to a nun seamstress who mends it expertly. In the summer, when the bean crop is ready for canning, conspicuous notices are posted on the campus, and all the nuns, college teachers, artists, and beekeepers gather in the convent court to snip beans for canning. When the laundress, familiar with soap suds and steam presses, finds herself bewildered by the Latin of her breviary prayers, she goes to a study club conducted by the college Latin professor. Many study clubs are conducted by college professors, and, as a result, the turkey tender may know Dante and the medievalists quite as well as she knows her birds. Work is parceled out, and there is much cooperation. Yet all work, whether it be a pan of biscuits or a poem, is regarded as essentially creative. Nuns who cook in the kitchen know that they create appetizing food from raw materials. The meat cook tends the roast from raw meat to platters carefully garnished with parsley. The baker sees giant cookies from recipe to anise frosting. To most persons, a nun seems chiefly a segregated woman wrapped away from the world in ten yards of surge. As we here see the Benedictines, they are interesting persons. They are friendly women who will come back from a walk with wet feet and carrying wood violets or pussy willows. They will roast frankfurters with a group of students and teach those same girls metaphysics. They are vital, matured women. Our instructors hold graduate degrees from large universities, often secular. They carry on the normal activities of educated women they read and play cards, chat together, and knit yards of khaki scarfs for the Red Cross. There is discipline in a Benedictine family. When people first learn that I attend a convent school, they look quizzical and say, But you are so independent. How do you bear the rules? There are rules here rules so elastic that many righteous parents would condemn the freedom we enjoy. Here, in a house of twelve hundred women and two hundred college girls, discipline is not a conscious problem. We are expected to follow a certain high standards of conduct, and we voluntarily follow them. Among the students there are, of course, occasional misdemeanors, sheet swiping, sleeping through breakfast, and clandestine midnight spreads. But concerning any important issues of conduct, there is no discipline problem. Living in a community where intelligent self-management is expected and practiced somehow effects that control. There are no artificial exercises set up to train our wills. College authorities take a sensible attitude toward our relations with young men because they know that friendship with them is normal and desirable. Informal Sunday afternoon dances, supervised by lay teachers, frequent club and discussion meetings with men from a nearby university, as well as formal balls, help us to meet young men in attractive surroundings. We are not given many lectures on conduct. We learn to live properly by living that way. We are being educated primarily for what we are to be, not what we are to do. And we are to be Christian gentlewomen. Here, training is accomplished, as in every family, by contact with people, those who live now and the great who have lived in the past. A girl majoring in English is required to read many classics in translation, the Iliad and the Odyssey, Plato's Dialogues, Aristotle's Ethics, the Aeneid, and the great Greek plays. Dante's Divine Comedy, Chaucer's Tales, the plays of Shakespeare, and all of Milton's English poetry are required reading. A fundamental training in metaphysics and the history of philosophy furnishes a sound background for these courses. 
Our teachers aim at one thing, to teach real values, and a real sense of the ultimate proportionate worth of things. We are taught one basis for judgment, Christian philosophy, and we are taught to make real judgments. Unlike most modern universities, we do not sin by historicism. To us, Aristotle and Aquinas and Dante are not merely impersonal, if interesting, historical figures. We admit frankly that they can touch us personally, can teach us how to live. From them we try to learn to live as a scholar, a metaphysician, and a Christian should. Every class and all student life is turned to this end. In psychology, a discussion of mental hygiene recognizes primarily that man is a creature of intellect and will. A class studying Milton's Paradise Lost may be fascinated by his devils, but they take time to see if he really portrays truth. There is a constant seeking for the clear self-luminous knowledge that is truth. Biology classes studying sex stop to look at the saneness of Christian marriage. No course specifically teaches this sense of values. No course does not teach it. The essential reason why this way of living and of education works lies deep in the hearts and lives of these women. It works because selfishness and individualism are supplanted by supernatural ideals, that in all things God may be glorified, the intention murmured before every class, before all work and play, stands as symbolic of the attitude which holds strictly to a hierarchy of values. All of life is turned toward its Creator. Early in the morning, at noon, in the late afternoon, Convent bells summon nuns to the chapel, from college classrooms and barns, from offices and farm trucks, to pray the divine office. St. Benedict called it the work of God. For four years I have lived as a communist. What I have known is a real spirit of family cooperation, a simple, useful life, and a sense of proportion. And I shall live as I have been trained, if I have a home and a happy family, if I can feel the earth under my fingers grow warm with spring, know intimately the sun and the wind, work with my mind and my hands, and always give praise to God.